Well, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload on this 18th of October, 2018. Yes, it is October. It is pumpkin season. Pumpkin spice season for those of you who uh, care to indulge. I am not one of them. But I do have to say that October does bring out the best in pumpkin pie. And I'm looking forward to having a slice right after the show ends today. Now that we are in October, we just passed a holiday, Columbus Day. You remember that holiday? It's not celebrated too much here in the Twin Cities area, but I do know that there are some communities that still do. Now the question I have for you, and this is, uh, we're actually doing two Prager University segments today, and this is the first one. Uh, it's a question. Should we celebrate Columbus Day? Let's find out what some students had to say. What's up guys, this is Will Witt with PragerU. Today we're at Wake Forest University here in North Carolina and we're asking students about Christopher Columbus and Columbus Day. Let's get started. What are your thoughts on Christopher Columbus? Um, mixed feelings. I don't really know. He we sucked. have school. Yeah, I mean. He's a pretty <laughs> terrible person. Uh, he kicked some foreigners out of their homeland. There was a lot of um, taking of indigenous lands. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of just general foolishness. Do you think he was a good guy? I don't know him personally, but uh, it's probably okay. Do you know what year Columbus sailed? 1782. Close. What year did Christopher Columbus sail over? Hypothetically, 1492. Hypothetically? Hypothetically. Could have been 1493. Could have been. What are the names of the three ships that he sailed over on? I have no idea. What are the names of the three ships that Christopher Columbus sailed on? Uh, Santa Maria, uh, Pina, and uh, Mayflower. No. Nina is on your shirt. Uh -huh. Mayflower? Nope. <laughs> Damn. It's a nerdy that I have a shirt on with the yeah, name. Helpful. <laughs> I'm trying to help and educate. Okay, thank you. Nina, Santa Maria, Pinta. Pinta, Pinta yeah. Hi. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, Christopher Columbus sailed over. Do you think we should change the name of the day? Uh, I think it just shouldn't be a day. Let's just not make it a day. I don't even think there should be a day necessarily. Uh, I think it's something relevant that we should celebrate to an extent just because uh, it's pretty foundational in our history and just how we kind of got started. <laughs> you think we should change it to Indigenous Peoples Day? I'm not even sure what that means. So. <laughs> Most people don't. What do you think we should name it to? Um. Kicking foreigners out of their territory day. <laughs> Do you think that we should give the land back to the Native Americans? That's a big idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, should Americans give the land back to the Native Americans? We're still working on acknowledging that we had American slavery for like 400 years. So I, I, would, I, would, I would advise baby steps. You're saying like what Christopher Columbus did was bad and we yeah. took the land from the Native Americans, right? So this is technically their land, right? Mm -hmm. So should we give it back to them? Uh, yeah, I think so. You want to pack your bags? We can leave right now. I mean, yeah, I got my backpack. I'm set. <laughs> Do you think we should give the land back to the Native Americans? Yeah, why not? We should leave. No. <laughs> pack your suitcases. You and I are going to leave. Just go. Let's go back to Europe. Oh my God, no. <laughs> And those are real live college students. When I first went to college, I already knew about the Nina and Pinta and Santa Maria. In fourth grade. I learned it in fourth grade. Um, I guess that just goes to show the modern state of the educational system. So some of the students, most of the students say, no, we shouldn't celebrate Columbus Day. But then they didn't even know who Christopher Columbus is. We are now going to show you the history of the holiday, Columbus Day. Here is the history. Italians have long celebrated Christopher Columbus in tribute to their shared heritage. In 1937, President Roosevelt proclaimed October 12th as Columbus Day. 
And in 1971, President Nixon declared Columbus Day a national holiday to be observed on the second Monday of October. Okay, and why? Because Columbus discovered America and proved that the Earth was round. Except that's not quite how it happened, which isn't to say we don't have plenty to thank him for. Let's take a look at Christopher Columbus, the man behind the myth, behind the holiday. We all know how it started. On August 3rd, 1492, Columbus and his three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, set out from Spain and embarked on an historic journey. True, but let's settle the why once and for all. Columbus wasn't trying to prove the Earth was round. He didn't need to. Greek mathematician Pythagoras suspected we were living on a sphere as early as the 6th century BC. And Aristotle backed him up two centuries later when he noticed the Earth's shadow could be seen during a lunar eclipse, sliding past the moon in miniature, and it was round. So why did Columbus bother getting off the couch at all? Money. In the 15th century, spices were a hot commodity. Traders shipping them between Asia and Europe could get rich quick. However, with the fall of Constantinople to the Turks, Europe lost its most popular route to the treasures of the East. Columbus realized his opportunity, become the first person to plot a Western route to Asia and enjoy unprecedented glory and riches. Inconsistent maps made calculating routes difficult. Columbus finally charted a southwestern course he believed was short enough to keep him and his men from dying of starvation and thirst. Spain's Queen Isabella, eager to expand her empire, agreed to roll the dice on Columbus's route. So on that August morning in 1492, Columbus and his men sailed off in those famous ships, laden with hopes of finding their way to Asia and making both Spain and themselves a heck of a lot of money. After a pit stop in the Canary Islands, the charted world was behind them. Columbus had been right not to trust existing maps, but he didn't realize that his own plotted course to Asia was short by nearly 10,000 miles. Luckily, a series of islands, the future West Indies, lay almost exactly where he believed India to be, and the relieved sailors made landfall. This is where things get tricky. We're still not sure of the exact location where Columbus first landed, but he was convinced he'd made it to India and declared the route successful. Mission accomplished. The Indians who greeted him were actually an indigenous people who had lived there for centuries. So the claim that Columbus discovered the Americas is only true from a European perspective. But as far as Columbus was concerned, he was right where he'd expected to be in an exotic land full of natives and spices. Columbus returned to the Spanish court a hero. All were convinced the route was a success, and it surely was, but not as they'd expected. Columbus inadvertently achieved the monumental task of joining the two hemispheres, in effect doubling the size of the habitable planet and establishing trade between the continents. So on Columbus Day, raise a glass to famed navigator Christopher Columbus, who missed the mark and hit it just the same. So there you have it. That is the history of Columbus Day. And thousands of people still celebrate Columbus Day. Again, like I say, not that much here, but you know, at the Minnesota State Capitol, there is a statue to Christopher Columbus. Are you aware of that? Now, I'm not going to disclose the location simply because you're going to have to look at it like the Pioneer Press treasure hunt. I'll let you hunt for it because it's there. But I'm not going to disclose because I don't want to have anybody uh, arrested for vandalizing it and then come back to see that, oh, I told you where it is. I'm sorry. Uh, if you're going to do anything like that, that's going to be on your own. But we do have a statue here. Very few people know about it. Very few people here care. But that's... That's life. But there are thousands who celebrate, and including this year, 
when they were at the Columbus Day Parade in New York City. Let's take a look. Italian music is blasted as loud as the speakers can go, and their red, white, and green flags are raised tall, too. It's the 74th annual Columbus Day Parade. We come every year to celebrate our Italian heritage. Born in Italy, raised in the United States, and proud to be an American Italian. When our family had come here four or five generations ago, they built New York. It's considered the world's largest celebration of Italian American culture. More than 100 groups are parading up Fifth Avenue, with hundreds of thousands of people cheering them on. This Long Island mother is here to watch her twins march in a band. It's always been special for us, but then to have my children march. My daughter is an alumni of Clark. She's marched. My twins are marching today for the first time, so it's really special. These Italian newlyweds are on their honeymoon, feeling right at home. It's a coincidence, but it's a, a special, beautiful co coincidence. Both Mayor Bill de Blasio and Governor Andrew Cuomo spending their afternoon marching. Oggi siamo tutti italiani. You know what that means? Today we are all Italian. But the governor is not the only Cuomo participating this year. His sister, Dr. Margaret Cuomo, was an honoree recognized for enhancing Italian language education across America. It's an honor because I feel very connected to my Italian heritage. My grandparents on both my mother's and my father's side emigrated from Italy to the United States. A family history most people here share, but all are celebrating. Ali Bauman, CBS2 News. So there you have it. Columbus Day is still celebrated. But notice that the Columbus Day celebration in New York City is really less about Columbus and more about Italian heritage. Kind of like St. Patrick's Day for the Italians. Hey, more power to you. Um, yet in far liberal, progressive, Democrat political cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul, there is continually a move to get rid of Columbus Day. And we're going to examine with our second Prager University segment. Don't worry, there's only two Prager Universities today. Um, uh, what happens if we say goodbye to Columbus Day? Thanksgiving. Independence Day, Memorial Day, holidays are a great time to riddle Americans with needless oppressive guilt. But the one that stands head and shoulders above the rest is Columbus Day. The day where progressives indoctrinate your children into believing Columbus to be Satan incarnate, the USA to be his evil spawn, and the Native Americans to be pacifists. And so now we have Indigenous Peoples Day, or as it would have been named 30 years ago, Aboriginals Day or as it would have been named 10 or 15 years ago, Native Americans Day, or as it could be named tomorrow in Canada, First Nation Peoples Day. Feeling the urge to self-inflict grievous bodily harm yet? That's only natural because the whole charade has become an exercise in hating Western civilization, which is really just an exercise in hating yourself. First, as far as Columbus goes, the guy deserves some credit. Right? Flawed, to be sure. But he was the greatest navigator of his age, the first person to cross the Atlantic from the continent of Europe, and he did so without any maps and only three small ships. If you can name them, by the way, comment below, as I'm sure your professor can't. But your professor probably has taught you the tale of Columbus as a villain, usually as a starting off point to indict the United States as a whole, often relying on a few key myths and some pivotal lies by omission. So, to start with, I'll bet that you probably believe Columbus and other European settlers to simply have committed mass genocide against Native Americans, sorry, indigenous. But here's the truth. While there were many examples of brutal warfare between Europeans and Native Americans, neither side actually committed genocide. In fact, there was never an outright policy of Indian extermination. The Native Americans were mostly wiped out through infectious diseases that the settlers had inadvertently brought with them. Of the estimated 250,000 natives in Hispaniola, Columbus's first stop in the Americas in 1492, new infectious diseases wiped out a staggering 95% of their population by 1517. As far as genocide by violence, you can look at any historical account of even the most one-sided battles and find that they were still just that, battles. Take Wounded Knee, although hundreds of years later, I only bring it up because I know that if I don't, you will. It's become ubiquitous with the idea of Native American genocide. After all, there were 150 to 350 aboriginals killed or wounded. That's terrible. But there were also 25 American soldiers killed and 39 wounded. That's not genocide. That's a one-sided beatdown with old glory wielding the hammer. And sometimes the massacres went the other direction. 
See the Apaches for reference, or the Comanches, or a dozen or so other tribes. So the natives often gave as good as they got. Not exactly the way genocide usually tends to work. Here's another thing I bet you've been made to believe, that many Native Americans, sorry American Indians, sorry I don't know what, take your pick, lived in harmony with the environment until Columbus arrived, and European settlers destroyed the land with their evil technology. Truth, not only did the natives brutally take out people, but they took out entire forests and hunted species to extinction. Squatting Bear and his First Nation buddies weren't hopping into kayaks to block whaling ships, probably because they were too busy killing seals to waterproof their kayaks. You also probably believe that the Native American, sorry, two-spirited First Nation something or other culture was a beautiful, pantheistic one of peace. The truth is, not so much. When Columbus arrived, the islands were inhabited by two main tribes. The Arawaks, who were passive and friendly, and the Caribs, who were vicious cannibals. The Arawaks actually lived in fear of the Caribs for, you guessed it, the reasons being that they hunted them down to enslave them and eat them. Yes, eat them. Ironically, we get the name Caribbean Islands from those famous people eaters. The only way settlers were able to conquer this land was through the help of Native Americans who teamed up with them to settle the score with other tribes who were even bigger jerks than they were. That's not even to mention the populations in Central and South America famous for ritual human sacrifice. You think Cortez was able to command and conquer with only 500 or so conquistadors? Of course not. It took 50,000 screaming, angry allied natives who'd had it up to here with being tortured, enslaved, and forced to carry gold for the other native Aztecs. At some point, they decided to roll the dice and go with the guy sporting funny beards and metal hats. None of this is to say that the early settlers were perfect, or that they didn't carry out their fair share of pretty scummy stuff, but to use America's mistakes as the brush with which to paint the entirety of its history while completely ignoring the indigenous lifestyle of barbarism and borderline evil is inaccurate at best, dishonest at worst. There were plenty of bloody, horrendous battles between the Europeans and the Indians. When a Neolithic tribe encounters a more technologically advanced people, the guys with the boom-boom sticks usually win. Columbus is not the issue here, and never was. This whole Indigenous Peoples Day charade is about teaching your children to despise Western civilization and anybody who dare defend it. But, and again, that could just be my Western civ privilege talking. Happy Columbus Day. I'm Steven Crowder for Prager University. Now, isn't that an interesting concept for discussion? That is true. There were a lot of warring factions amongst Native peoples. In fact, here in Minnesota, the Cherokee, the Ojibwa, not Cherokee, see, I got Cherokee in my brain right now. The Ojibwa, or Chippewa, uh, and the Dakota didn't get along. In fact, I've been to some ceremonies, and the uh, Dakota and Chippewa still don't get along. They're enemies. They're not the only ones. There are many, many other tribes who are that way. Um, so here we treat every American Indian tribe and, you know, equally, even though the tribes themselves are different. In fact, if you look at what most people think that an American Indian or Native American looks like, you would get the idea of the big flowing headdress, and the muscular shape, kind of looking like Sitting Bull or Crazy Horse, uh, or some of the actual Plains Indians that you may have seen on the uh, 1990 film Dances with Wolves. Not Kevin Costner, mind you. Uh, he, he was the fake Indian. Um, but they did use some people from uh, some of the Dakota tribes uh, as extras in that film. That's the romanticized impression we get a lot of that actually from wild bill uh, buffalo bill cody when his and he had his wild west show going around around 1910 and um, buffalo bill cody actually hired dakota indians plains indians to go around the world with him on his wild west show that's how people actually get the concept of an indian uh, as being a plains indian but that's a lot different than the wampanoag people or the Nar Narragansett people from the uh, Rhode Island and uh, Massachusetts Bay area, uh, where the Thanksgiving is, uh, first Thanksgiving was held. That's different than a uh, removed Indian in formerly Indian territory, now known as Oklahoma. That's also different than what the Seminoles are like in Florida. And then, of course, you've got the Navajo and the Apache 
in uh, the Southwest and the Hopi people in Colorado. And then you got the Tlingit up in the uh, Alaska and, uh, and Northwestern Canada. You got the uh, Creek, the Tlingit in Canada. And everyone looks a little different. Everyone acts like a little different. Um, I'm telling you this because I've spent a good portion of my life actually studying uh, American Indian people. I, I refuse to call them native peoples and the reason I don't call them native peoples is because if you're born in America you're a native person. I was born in Washington DC. I'm native to the United States of America. That's it. I'm native too. I may not actually be American Indian but I'm native. So a slight variance on the uh, on the terminology and the reason I intentionally use American Indian and from a lot of the American Indians that I've talked to and some I've actually had in class they've said you know I just call us an American Indian we're fine with that okay so I'm going to continue to call them American Indians because I've had American Indians tell me I can call them that um, but now this whole thing about Columbus you know, it, we're barking up the wrong tree. We're going to show another video here. Um, the guy on this video really does make a lot of sense. That all of this, it kind of on the, uh, on the Crowder video, kind of accentuates that a little bit. The fact is that this is more about punishing the white man. It's what it is. So we're going to take a look about smearing Columbus. No holiday for the white man. Hello, I'm Jared Taylor with American Renaissance. Did you celebrate Columbus Day? Well, enjoy it while you can. A lot of cities don't celebrate it anymore. This year, even the city of Columbus, Ohio, which is named after him, said it just couldn't afford a celebration. The fashionable thing is to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day instead. Recently, Los Angeles, Cincinnati, Boise, and Detroit all dropped Columbus for an Indigenous Peoples Day. When Somerville, Massachusetts announced the switch in September, Mayor Joe Curtatoni explained that, quote, Columbus Day is a relic of an outdated and oversimplified version of history. He said he's Italian-American, and he'd like to be proud of Columbus, but that would be like Southerners being proud of the Confederacy. Well, did you hear that, Governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo? Mr. Cuomo, also Italian-American, says that the statue of Columbus in New York City will stay for as long as he's in office. And the mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, yet another Italian-American, is determined to keep the statue too. He says Columbus is completely different from, say, Robert E. Lee. I don't see why. If Italians can have their genocidal, racist, disease-spreading, imperialist, slave driver, why can't Southerners have their Christian soldier? Mr. Cuomo and Mr. de Blasio will learn soon enough that you can't carve out exceptions for any dead white man. Statues of Columbus have been taking a real beating. Here's the one in Central Park in New York. Note the blood on his hands. The one in Bridgeport, Connecticut has kill the colonizer, along with the red treatment. Here's Columbus in Buffalo, New York, in Columbus Park. And here he is in downtown Detroit with a tomahawk stuck in his head. Here's more red paint in Houston, and also in Richmond, Virginia. I, I think you get the idea. And don't worry, it's not anti-Italian prejudice. People go after Norse explorers, too. In Minnesota, Leif Erikson's statue had the words Discoverer of America crossed off the base. In Philadelphia, a statue of Thorfinn Karlsfinni that had stood there for nearly a century was pitched into the river. Karlsfinni was the father of the first white child born in North America. There's now a movement to junk the entire federal Columbus Day holiday and whoop up indigenous peoples instead. And have you noticed that whenever something honors a white person and gets abolished, it's always replaced with the opposite. When you ditch Columbus, you celebrate Indians. When you take down Robert E. Lee, you put up 
Frederick Douglass. If Andy Jackson's got to go, you have to replace him with Harriet Tubman. Franklin Roosevelt established the Columbus holiday in 1937. In a 1940 statement, he said, Columbus began a great movement of people, quote, from every country in Europe. Yeah, back in those days, immigrants meant Europeans. But for the Columbus haters, everything that has happened since 1492 is a disaster. Renaming Columbus Day Indigenous Peoples Day implies that white people should never have come here. But someone was going to take over. The place was still in the Stone Age. Do Columbus haters think the country would be better off if the Chinese or the Turks had moved in? Europeans, white people, turned a wilderness into the richest, most powerful nation on earth. And what's our reward? We're supposed to put the country up for grabs. Here's the hip new slogan. No one is illegal on stolen land. You see, it was very bad for us to take the land from the Indians, but it's good for Nigerians and Vietnamese to take it from us. Can someone explain that to me? So what happens when we dump Columbus Day and celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day instead? Are we going to think pious thoughts about the Blackfeet and the Kickapoo? Well, a few people in headdresses are going to be trotted out for a parade, but the new holiday has different purposes. The first, of course, is to take a poke at yet another dead white man. But the second is to take a poke at all white Americans by telling them the country doesn't belong to them. And the very same people who want to boot Columbus are the ones who think the country belongs to anyone from anywhere who can manage to sneak in. They want to celebrate Indians and then stuff the country with Haitians and Pakistanis and Vietnamese how does that help the Indians? We're back to the same old con game. It was evil for white people to come here, but it's great for everyone else. If Columbus is a villain, all white people are villains. Supreme Court Justice Roger Taney, who sat outside the Maryland State House since 1872, had to go. Stephen Foster had to go from Pittsburgh. Dr. James Sims, the father of gynecology, was kicked off of Central Park in New York City. Even President William McKinley got the boot from the central square of Arcata, California. What did McKinley do? And here's what recently happened to Abraham Lincoln in a black neighborhood in Chicago. That statue has taken such a beating over the years, the city has just taken it away. So much for the great emancipator. The United States was built by pioneers, settlers, farmers, engineers. Whites built a country that attracts people from all over the world. So you think it was wrong for us to have come? Well, fine. Would all those newcomers who love to tell us how awful we are want to stay if the place was still in the Stone Age? Yes, we conquered the continent. That's how history works. But as my late Comanche friend David Yeagley used to say, Whites are unique in the respect they pay to the people they defeat. Look at all the Indian names of states, cities, rivers, of military hel helicopters, and yes, sports teams. They are high tribute to a defeated enemy. Do you see any of that spirit in the people who tear down our statues, insult our heroes, and want our country? No, this isn't about Columbus and a few statues. It's a denial of every shred of American culture, tradition, and history that can be traced to whites. And the sooner we recognize that, the better. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So, what did you think of that? It's quite a thought-provoking piece, and I am actually in agreement there. Um, especially when it comes to what do the Indians have to say? And that, that was a very profound quote that I greatly appreciate in the fact that the white man is the one that vanquishes and conquers, but then can actually understand and make peace. Uh, yes, I'm paraphrasing. I bring all of this up today because of something that happened in the news, and we've heard about it now for six long years. 
Elizabeth Warren, U.S. Senator from Massachusetts, made the claim for many years that she was a Cherokee. She said it. And I believe that she tried to use that to help get her a job. Really nice paying job in academia at Harvard. But we found out this week that it all unraveled. And so we're going to take a look right now. Um, I'm trying to remember when this was. This might have been 20. Yeah, this one is uh, 2012. So this is during the 2012 election cycle when she was running against then incumbent uh, Senator Scott Brown. Uh, we're talking, and there's two guys talking about. Uh, and they're from both from Massachusetts, talking about uh, Elizabeth Warren's claim of Native American heritage helping get her a job. So let's take a look from the 2012 campaign. Elizabeth Warren, kind of a darling of the left, uh, who uh, helped create this uh, Consumer Fin Financial Protection Bureau in Washington, running against uh, Scott Brown, who, uh, of course, uh, got the seat in a special election when uh, Ted Kennedy passed away. Now, uh, what's come up lately is uh, Ms. Warren, a uh, uh, Harvard Law School professor, uh, at various times in her career has been identified as a Native American. And uh, looking at her, it, it doesn't necessarily seem plausible. No, I mean, you look at her and she's as white as a ghost of a polar bear after a dental bleaching in a snowstorm. Uh, but she uh, was listed in various law school faculty directories in the 1980s and 90s as a, quote, Native American, American Indian uh, law professor. Uh, she seems to have dropped that designation about the time she came to Harvard in the mid-90s. In 1996, the Harvard Crimson the student newspaper uh, quoted a law a Harvard Law School spokesman is saying uh, it's it, there is a you know big to do over diversity or lack of diversity in the law school. And he says, well, you know, it's not it's not true that we don't have any uh, female minority law professors. Look at Elizabeth Warren; she's a Native American. That's uh, right. So they they've been uh, or at various times uh, she's been identified as such. Right now, there has been lately now a hunt for evidence. Uh, at first, uh, it appeared to be completely baseless, but now we get word that. Uh, some generations back, uh, there apparently was a, uh, a Native American a, a, ancestor. A genealogist who said that he couldn't find any evidence, uh, who told, he told the Boston Herald, which has been uh, really uh, in the lead on this, this story, story. Yeah. he told them that he couldn't find any Indian ancestors. Now he says he's found a, I guess it's a great, great, great grandmother. So she's 132nd American Indian, if this is true. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with being part American Indian. We celebrate the diversity of America. But if she, uh, used this to get uh, advantages in her career, earlier in her career, and of course this sort of so-called diversity is quite beneficial for advancing in academia, uh, and then turned around and drop this designation to avoid the stigma of being an affirmative action hire, uh, this looks really bad. Well, well uh, speaking of uh, talking about political impact now, and I think we've got a, a graphic, uh, latest Rasmussen poll, this is a very tight race. Um, it was it was expected to be tight, and uh, it's uh, both sides raising a lot of money. I'm wondering about the political impact here because, uh, as you've said, uh, uh, this is not uh, necessarily uh, going to be welcomed by voters if there's a perception that she used this to advance her career, dropped it uh, after she had already become a Harvard uh, law professor. Now we should say her campaign has been putting out denials, including a statement from one Jay Westbrook of the University of Texas where she once worked. He says, quote, to suggest that she needed some special advantage to be hired here or anywhere is just silly. She was hired for her great abilities as a teacher and scholar. Her family tree had nothing to do with it. Uh, I tend to discount this denial. If you can find me an example of a college administrator admitting that somebody was hired right. because of his family tree and not for his great abilities, uh, I will take this more seriously. But I think this is the sort of fiction that goes along with affirmative action in general. It's part of why the whole thing is so corrupt. As for the political uh, implications, uh, look, Massachusetts has a lot of Irish and Italian people uh, who may uh, have voted for Ted Kennedy but who don't benefit from racial preferences and may not like seeing, uh, seeing this sort of thing. And there's also a class issue here. There was a, 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 a case some years ago in which a couple of uh, Irish-American firemen claimed 
based on very similar claims of family lore and photographs of their ancestors that they were part black. They were actually fired for, for racial fraud under Boston civil service laws. Uh, a, an elite lawyer, lawyer shouldn't be able to get away with this sort of thing if an ordinary working stiff can't. Well, I also I do wonder what the reaction is going to be. You now have uh, the Boston Herald uh, quoting a, a leader of a Native American group, uh, essentially saying, oh, wait a minute, Elizabeth Warren is not a real Native American. That job could have gone to uh, someone, I, I suppose, with more... Uh, uh, obvious uh, lineage. Right. I mean, look, the idea that being a Native American, uh, that, that some percentage of Native American blood qualifies you for a job as a law professor is kind of weird in the first place. But that's where we've come with uh, Justice O'Connor and the whole diversity rationale for racial preferences, which, by the way, may uh, be on the verge of falling in the next Supreme Court term, because ironically, the court is hearing a case involving the University of Texas where Professor Warren used to work. So what goes around comes around. I think some. So that is the discussion that occurred back in 2012. And as you probably know by now, it has not stopped. That's been one thing that's been haunting Elizabeth Warren in her entire U.S. Senate career. But if you're going to run around talking about being Cherokee and you don't have the documentation to prove it and then you use that on a application to bump ahead with affirmative action for your own benefit, people have problems with that. And that's one of the reasons it's being talked about in the news right now. It's being talked about because she fraudulently scooted herself to the front of the line. That's really what the issue is. Um, we're going to look at our 2018 opponent, uh, Jeff Deal. And he ended up making a uh, words to that effect on a, on a radio program um, on the fact that she jumped to the head of the line. Let's see what he had to say. I think some people are remain concerned about it. I mean, we've even heard the president sort of poke her on the issue. Really what she did was she checked off a box for a minority hire position, not once but twice, not just at Harvard but at Penn as well. And uh, I think the problem people have with that is that, you know, they feel that she probably sort of stretched the, um, the margins there of, of the ethics on taking what is considered to be a minority hire when she had very little, you know, a, a remote claim to it to begin with. The other interesting thing, too, is I guess there's a registry book for lawyers, and you list yourself whether you have that sort of mm -hmm. heritage or not, right. and that's how they look you up and see if you want to, they want you as a candidate. And I guess after she had gotten the Harvard position, she eliminated that listing uh, or that that part of her listing that said that she like was... Like she didn't need it American. anymore because yeah. she had already gotten a job. But I think the biggest concern is that it was taking away a minority hire, somebody else who, you know, that was intended for, you know, on a different basis. And I think that tends to anger people, um, not just, I wouldn't say just the law community who may be looking for that position, but I think generally speaking, people uh, of true minority status that, you know, have those affirmative action, um, you know, hiring uh goals out there for the companies and and maybe they're getting turned away because somebody else is taking that spot that's that's really what I think people are uh, upset about is that she took that spot that somebody else deserved and I just want and that's really what the big issue is all about because frankly whether or not Elizabeth Warren is an American Indian or whether she isn't it doesn't really make that much of a difference to hardly anybody except maybe the Cherokee uh, but the fact is, if you're going to use that status, uh, you better be able to prove it. Now, I'm going through a list right here on tribal membership. There are uh, tribes. I'm, I'm not going to give you the complete list because we can spend the rest of the show just reading a list. It's not going to really do much for any of us. Uh, I'm going to just give you tribes requiring half-degree blood quantum for membership. So it's the equivalent of one parent. Uh, the Chippewa Cree in Montana... The uh, Miccosukee Tribes of Indians of Florida. The Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians in Mississippi. As opposed to the band that's in Oklahoma. Uh, but the Mississippi Band uh, require half. The St. Croix Chippewa Indians of Wisconsin. Uh, and we'll leave that for the half. There are a few other tribes. But most require either one quarter degree, so one grandparent, uh, or one eighth. So for one quarter, 
uh, the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes in uh, Oklahoma, uh, the Blackfeet tribe of Blackfeet Indian Reservation of Montana, Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin, Hopi tribe of Arizona, the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma, uh, Lac du Flambeau Ojibwe Nation in Wisconsin, the Mohawk tribe, the Navajo Nation, uh, the United Tribe of Indians in Wisconsin, uh, Seminole Tribe of Florida, and then we'll move on to one eighth degree blood quantum from membership, which is essentially one great grandparent. Uh, the Comanche Nation in Oklahoma, the Delaware Nation in Oklahoma, uh, the Ponca Nation in Oklahoma. And those are just a few. The Sac and Fox Nation in Missouri, of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. The Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. Again, a lot of them from Indian Territory. And then you have tribes requiring 1 16th. So it's one great, great grandparent. Uh, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in North Carolina. The Fort Sill Apache Tribe. Uh, the Caddo Nation. And then you have one other category, well, two other categories. One is called membership by lineal descent, which means you have there's no blood quantum requirement, but you have to have a paper trail going back to one of the enrollees, mainly for the Dawes Act from 1906. Uh, the Cherokee Nation, the Chickasha, the Choctaw, uh, essentially the five civilized tribes, they're all on it. The Osage Nation. Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians of Michigan, the Wyandotte Nation, Muscogee Creek Nation, uh, and then you have three that really require blood quantum and lineal descent, uh, Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Indian Reservation, that's out in Oregon, the uh, Little Traverse Bay Bands of uh, Odawa Indians, which I think is in Lower Michigan, and then the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians. I think that's also in Michigan. I'm not sure on that. Uh, those are the three that require both. So if you look at lineal descent, 1 16th and 1 8th blood quantum required for tribal membership, that is what you need in order to be able to check those boxes and receive federal funding and receive American Indian preference points for employment applications. If you don't have that, you don't do it. You don't use it. You know, there are, I'm sure there are a lot of Dakota and Ojibwa right here in the Twin Cities who are members of their respective nations and respective bands who should be able to use this to jump at the head of the line. And the last thing you want is somebody who doesn't belong there jumping ahead of somebody who deserves to be there. So I think that's what gotten a lot of people really upset at Elizabeth Warren. Um, now, of course, once President Trump got into the candidacy and picked a fight with uh, the senator, he started calling her Focahontas and Pocahontas. And being Trump being Trump, he's jabbed and jabbed and jabbed, including... A jab on November 27th, 2017, so last year, and I think we actually may have aired this on our show when this happened last year. Uh, so here is President Trump discussing Senator Warren with some American Indians in the White House. And I just want to thank you because you're very, very special people. You were here long before any of us were here. Although we have a representative in Congress who they say was here a long time ago. They call her Pocahontas. But you know what? I like you because you are special. You are special people. You are really incredible people. And I have to, from the heart, from the absolute heart, we appreciate what you've done, how you've done it, the bravery that you displayed, and the love that you have for your country, Tom, I would say that's as, as good as it gets, wouldn't you say? President Trump's
So there he was with Navajo co uh, Code Talkers and uh, discussing Elizabeth Warren and talking about um, you know, them. Now, of course, because of the Pocahontas comments in, uh, on that day, Senator Warren responded. Here's what she had to say. President Trump speaking at an event uh, at the White House honoring Native Americans once again, uh, alluding to you as Pocahontas. What's your response? Uh, this was an event that was to honor war heroes, to honor people who had put it all on the line for America and for America's allies, to honor people who had saved countless lives, both of Americans and of our allies around the world. It's an honoring ceremony. And that Donald Trump has to get in a racist slur is truly disgusting. Now, look, he's going to keep doing this. He thinks somehow it's going to make me shut up. It hasn't worked in the past. Not going to work in the future. One final question or two quick questions. Uh, there's been a... So we're going to, he ended up going on uh, some other unrelated topics. So uh, we cut back a little earlier. That was from November of last year. And here Elizabeth Warren talks about how Trump is making a racist statement. Is it a racist statement to call a white person a fake Indian? If you're a fraud? I mean, he's talking to real Indians right there. He was honoring them. He was not slamming them. He was slamming somebody who doesn't belong there with the title. I don't get where Elizabeth Warren's coming from here. I just honestly don't. So now, in March of this year, um, she responded to an editorial asking her to prove her Native American ancestry. So in an editorial this week, the Berkshire Eagle called on you to take a DNA test to put your Native American heritage to rest. I want to read something, quote something they said. Quote, so we call upon our senior senator to screw up her courage and take the spit test. If she already has but is keeping the result under wraps, we urge her to be forthcoming with them. Will you take a DNA test? No, look, I think this was fully litigated in 2012 here in Massachusetts. I think Scott Brown raised this issue every single day during the but campaign. It keeps, it keeps coming up for you. Well, you know, the way I see it, at the end of the day, what the people of Massachusetts said is they cared a whole lot more about their families than they did about my background. My brothers and I, we grew up in Oklahoma. Um, we know our story from our mom and our dad and our grandmothers and our grandfather and from our aunts. And that's and sufficient for you, uncles. the no, story. Yes. It's been just fine for my brothers and me. Now, I will actually give Senator Warren the benefit of the doubt on this one here. Um, I'm looking something up here real quick. Uh, the fact is, I actually have heritage from Oklahoma. And I'm not kidding here. My father was born in Oklahoma. He was raised in Oklahoma. He died in Oklahoma. My grandmother was born in Kansas and raised in Oklahoma and died in Oklahoma. And her parents were born and raised in Oklahoma. So on and so forth. I can go back generations into Oklahoma. As a matter of fact, I know my genealogy because of a challenge that my father had for me back in 1991. He said, son, there's some people in this family who say we're Cherokee and others who say we're Choctaw and I'm charging you to find out exactly what we are. So that's where I got started in genealogy and family history. We were brought up believing that we were Cherokee or Chakta. But the fact is, my father knew, as did I, that neither of us could actually make that claim without the paperwork to back it up. That's why I was the one searching the you know, geneal genealogy. I was learning about what it took for tribal acceptance, blood quantum, lineal descent, Dawes rolls, Ian Miller rolls, and other types of Cherokee census. That's where I learned about the eastern band of the Cherokee who ended up f fleeing to the hills of North Carolina 
so they wouldn't have to be rounded up and shipped to this foreign country called Indian Territory at gunpoint by the soldiers from the U.S. Army. I knew all that history because I was trying to discover whether or not my family was there. Fact is, 20 years of searching, I pretty much had a definitive answer. I went back to my father and said, Dad, I figured out what we are. We're Norman. Norman? From Normandy, back in 9-11. We haven't found any American Indian blood. I can pretty much definitively rule out being Cherokee. I still hold a little hope that there might be Choctaw, but it's not going to be enough to have tribal membership. It's not going to be enough to have any type of affirmative action. Sure, if I do happen to have an ancestor, I might be able to say, yeah, I've got a little Choctaw in me, but certainly not enough to put on an application. That's just a matter of pride. It's all in how you use that. So yes, yeah, so Elizabeth Warren hearing uh, that the stories and growing up, and she was born in Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma City, June 22nd, 1949. I can understand where she came up with that. And I don't have a problem with that because the same types of stories were told in my family. And the fact is that Oklahoma was created out of Indian Territory. It wasn't opened up until around 1907, 1906, 1907. Uh, my ancestry in Oklahoma, which I have paperwork on, actually predates statehood. And if I so chose, I could become a member of the first families of the Twin Territories. That's kind of their equivalent in Oklahoma of the Minnesota Territorial Pioneers, the people who can chase their uh, genealogy back prior to statehood. I can do that for Oklahoma. Can't do it here. I, I'm like the only one here. But the fact is, I can see how she can come up with that. I am extremely disappointed in how she's used that because it's just not right. So now she hit back at President Trump just two days ago. Let's see what she has to say. Hi, this is Elizabeth Warren. Is Dr. Bustamante in, please? Hi, I'm Carlos Bustamante, and I've advised companies in the direct-to-consumer space, including Ancestry.com, 23andMe, and Helix. In the senator's genome, we did find five segments of Native American ancestry with very high confidence, where we believe the error rate is less than one in a thousand. We will very gently take that kit, and we will slowly toss it. To be very gentle. And we will say, I will give you a million dollars to your favorite charity, paid for by Trump, if you take the test and it shows you're an Indian, you know. Uh, Senator Warren released some of her DNA results that show a strong likelihood that she does have Native American uh, roots. How much? One, one thousand? Do you owe her an no, apology? Is, no, what about the money so. that you... I owe her. She owes the country an apology. What about percentage. the money that you told her you would... Uh, you mean if she gets the nomination in the debate where I was going to have her tested? I'll only do it if I can test her personally, okay? That will not be something I enjoy doing either. So she announced the other day that, you know, as you just saw the announcement there, that she is, you know, has some degree of Native American blood in her, but it's less than 164th and probably greater than one 1,024th. What? How can you consider yourself to be that? I mean, I have an ancestor. I've seen the paper trail going back to, I think, the Prince of Kiev in Russia. I have one person who happens to have been a very influential person in Russia. That does not make me Russian. I speak a little Russian. I took the first quarter of Russian twice at the University of Minnesota to show you what kind of good Russian I am. I failed it both times. I'm not proud of that. But I couldn't pick up that language. I am definitely not Russian. Even if I was 1, 1,024th, I'm not Russian. If Elizabeth Warren is 1, 1,024th, 
American Indian or Native American. She's not an American Indian. And that leads us to, I guess, well, I got two things we're going to kind of wrap up on here. First of all, uh, one thing about what we do know about Elizabeth Warren's ancestry. Her great, great, great grandfather, Jonathan Crawford, he actually was with Tennessee militia. And uh, this gives Elizabeth Warren a 132nd or 3.125% Tennessee militia heritage. Um, for being somebody who actually rounded up Cherokee on the Trail of Tears. Now, in defense of Elizabeth Warren, I will have to say it's not her fault. If you trace your lineage back far enough, you'll probably find a few bad apples too. We've all got them in our tree. That's the way of life. We've got people in our genealogy we're not proud of. I've got two Civil War deserters in my family. Now, I kind of have to say that if one of the grandfathers, it was father and son, I, uh, I'm not downline on the, on the son, but at least on the uh, father's side, that is a uh, direct grandfather. And when he deserted with most of the members of his company, or actually regiment, uh, they just kind of walked off the job in Kentucky and went home to Illinois and ended up, fathering a kid before he went back in the army when they finally caught up with him. So for that line of the family, that's probably a good thing that he deserted. But the biggest thing I want to point out is this is all the failure of identity politics. It's really what it comes down to. Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day, Elizabeth Warren is a Native American. She's a Cherokee. Oh, no, she's not. Elizabeth Warren is a descendant of Tennessee militia. Yes, she is. What happens when your own personal history contradicts itself? This is what happens when we ended up putting ourselves in conundrums with having to put people in stereotypical boxes called identity politics. And then I'm going to add one more thing on here. Rachel Dolezal, do you remember her? She's the person who said, oh, I'm black because I feel like I'm black. And then Richard Blumenthal, U.S. Senator from New Jersey. I'm a Vietnam veteran, except he was never in Vietnam. Don't lie to us, people. And yes, I may point it out, Democrats, I'm sure that there's a few Republicans out there too. The fact is, just be honest. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with the rest of us. And I think we'll all just get along just fine. So as we have one minute left, we're going to leave you with the Cherokee National Youth Choir singing North Wind. Dallas Pearson producer, I'm your host Jeff Williams. You are watching North Star Oasis, reminding you that there are 67 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.